It was a terrifying and deadly moment during a Trump rally in Pennsylvania, a bullet grazing former President Trump's ear, one person dead and another seriously injured after an assassination attempt that sent shockwaves around the world. It's time to wake up Washington after an already turbulent year of political threats and accusations and a country seriously divided, both President Biden and former President Trump have called for Americans to tone down the political rhetoric and unite this country. Unite America, Trump posted on Truth Social following the attempted assassination, while Biden called for unity in his Oval Office address. You know, the political record in this country has gotten very heated. It's time to cool it down. But is it really possible to unite a country so deeply divided? Joining us now to discuss this is Professor of Political Science at the University of Washington, James Long. James, thanks so much for joining me here today. You know, historically, do events like this, uh, meaning the attempted assassination on former President Trump, unify the country or just serve to further divide us? I think in this case, it will serve to further divide us. Uh, the last president who was shot was Ronald Reagan in 1981, and his polling numbers did go up uh, after that. They went up by probably double digits. Um, but, you know, he had just been elected. He had the goodwill of the country already. Uh, thankfully, he survived his injuries. And so by 1984, when voters were thinking about whether or not to reelect Reagan, you know, other things mattered more, I think. And I, the fact that he had been shot, um, I don't think really played into it. I think with Trump, you know, most voters and most Americans have their minds made up. And so I don't think they're necessarily changing how they think about Trump or Biden um, or, or other aspects of the election. I think probably it's just the, the case that Americans are now having to really confront a very recent occurrence of political violence and what that means for our democratic system. Right. And all coming just a day before the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. So definitely references to the ass attempted assassination at the floor at the convention in Wisconsin. So, James, prior to the attempted assassination, the U.S. was already very deeply divided. When was the last time we've seen the U.S. this polarized politically? Most people I talk to say the Civil War or pre-Civil War. I don't know if I would go that far back. Um, I think the comparison that a lot of social scientists are making is with the 1960s, um, which is before I was alive, but I have studied um, history and, and politics in that era. And I think in 1968 in particular, which of course has resonance of political assassinations, unfortunately with RFK Jr. and MLK, as well as the Democratic Convention in the city of Chicago. Um, and you know, questions about a sitting president and whether he should run for re-election, although by the time of the convention, LBJ had decided not to run for re-election. But just divisions in this country over civil rights, over the Vietnam War, um, over women's rights and gay rights, really dividing the country, not just politically, but also culturally. And this sort of sense that things were, ch were really changing, and they did really change. And, and through the 70s as well, I think the country was very divided. Then by the 1980s, I think things unified a little bit more uh, Ronald Reagan came into office, was very popular, was obviously reelected in, in 1984. And so I think the 1960s is probably a better comparison um, than, than saying the Civil War before the Civil War. Yeah, definitely a bit more, even though the 1960s were very tumultuous, definitely a bit more optimistic than saying the Civil War. And obviously a lot of comparisons, particularly to, um, you know, the Democratic Party, the Democratic National Convention is obviously coming up. And I see a lot of parallels between uh, this upcoming election or convention, excuse me, and the DNC in 1968. So both Biden and Trump have called for unity in the wake of this assassination. James, do you see that? actually happening? And if not, what else will it even take at this point? Well, my instinct is to say no. But I would temper that by saying that Donald Trump will have an opportunity tomorrow when he accepts the nomination at the RNC to sort of give us really his first public statement, but sort of what his ideas around unity might be. We've already heard from President Biden. We heard from him on Saturday night after the event occurred. We heard his Oval Office address on Sunday. He has subsequently made other statements in the interview with Lester Holt. So I think we've heard from Biden's side how he's thinking about this. So I think we should reserve judgment until tomorrow and give Trump the opportunity to make a public statement and how he intends to unify the country. But I'm deeply skeptical. Um, I think voters that hate Donald Trump hate him as much this week as they did last week. I think mm. voters that love Donald Trump 
they may love him a little bit more, but I don't think, you know, the, the core MAGA base has changed at all. And I don't think the Democrats that are opposed to Donald Trump have changed at all. That's not to say that any side is necessarily in favor of, of political violence, but I think it means that we still remain deeply divided and deeply polarizing. What would yeah. cause us to overcome that difference, I think, mm -hmm. is the type of leader who can bring Americans together. Donald Trump is not that leader. Um, if, if we look at if we look you know, historically at the way he's behaved, he's often doubled down. He has called for violence or joked about violence against his uh, real or perceived uh, political enemies. His, he has encouraged violence at his uh, rallies. He, he incited a violent insurrection to overthrow a free, free and fair election. So I'm deeply skeptical that Donald Trump could be that person. I think Joe Biden in his person wants to be that person, but I think the, the fears with Joe Biden is whether or not he's too old, whether or not he's really, he may be right in his sentiment, but he may not be the right sort of body and, and face uh, in place to, to make that case uh, strongly for the Democrats. But so right now I'm deeply skeptical, unfortunately. We know that former President Trump has said he tore up his original RNC uh, convention speech in favor of something that he says is more unifying post-assassination attempts. So we'll have to see how that plays out. So, James, we've seen the blame game, unfortunately, really rearing its ugly head. How dangerous is it in this political climate to throw blame around when it comes to a violent incident like this? Yeah, that's a very good question to a social scientist, because I'm going to answer it like a social scientist, which is to say that, you know, first and foremost, we need to blame the perpetrator and the alleged gunman, you know, has, has obviously been killed by Secret Service. But that person is directly responsible for what happened. And it is nearly impossible to try to draw any causal link between what he did. And we still don't know his motives. We still don't know a lot about the case. And so I hesitate to even um, to even sort of raise what his possible motives might be, but to draw a causal link between something he may have believed or thought or been told and the actions that he took. He was, he was an adult, as I understand, he was 20 years old, if, you know, assuming that he is the, the perpetrator, and therefore he is, he is responsible for his actions and no one else is directly responsible. And that being said, I think what your question gets at is just, is this larger environment and polarization and partisanship, is it creating an environment where, you know, otherwise sort of well-meaning young men who you know weren't necessarily interested in politics or or thought to become violent that that might activate something uh, among them and there i think the social science research is a little bit harder to sort of summarize and generalize but it's definitely the case that the more you hear a particular type of rhetoric whether that's from politicians that you support or media that you consume or your family members or people in your community or your friends the more that you just sort of believe it, you don't question it, you don't push back against it, it just kind of becomes a regular. I mean, that is what Goebbels meant by the big lie, that if Hitler just kept repeating the same thing over and over again, particularly around his anti-Semitic comments, that people would just start to believe that they're true, even if the first time they heard them, it wasn't true. Um, and so I think that that kind of wears folks down. And where people like me get really worried is that what it does is it's not just that it may inspire violence among specific individuals, although that is a problem. But what it does among the body politic more generally is allow all of us to kind of think, you know, when what would be the conditions under which we would support the erosion of democratic institutions or norms? You know, would it be something like the January 6th riot? Would there be conditions under which now p everyday people are thinking about, well, what would happen if a candidate were assassinated? And, in, and that's a dangerous territory to be in. We want the body politic in an election period to be reinforcing democratic institutions, the rule of law and norms, and not sort of thinking, okay, well, if it were my side or if it were the other guy, would I actually be cheering? Would I be happy about this? Would this be a mobilizing a force to get me to engage in behavior that I might otherwise repudiate? So, James, as you know, just as we wrap up, we know that Trump has officially named J.D. Vance, the Ohio senator, as his vice presidential pick. We've seen inflammatory language from Vance in the past against Trump, going as far to refer to him as America's Hitler. Since then, Vance has done a complete 180, changed his tune, and has become a staunch Trump supporter. Um, you know, even so, how concerning is it that that kind of inflammatory language is that kind of language in this country right now? I think it depends on what the message is. Um, and so this is where, you know, I think 
the specific words matter. And there are certain words that I think are entirely appropriate in a campaign that don't, you know, cross the boundaries and words that might. So, for example, I think the Biden campaign truly believes that Donald Trump is an existential threat to democracy. But you don't have to believe the Biden campaign. You can just look at what Trump has done in his words and what he promises to do in the future. He did uh, incite a violent mob, mob to try to overturn a free and fair election. And so he has promised that. And so to me, simply saying that he is an existential threat for democracy to democracy is not just empirical, but it's not even something that's generated from the Biden side. Rather, it's coming from the Trump side. That, I think, is very different than joking even in a sly way about uh, an assassination of a candidate like Trump did in 2016 with respect to the Second Amendment and Hillary Clinton or language around, you know, using any kind of imagery or language around the use of guns or bombs or things like that. That I think that 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 crosses the line. America's Hitler, I think, is very much a matter of perspective because the reason people make that statement it's not as an empirical assessment to say this person really is like Hitler, although they might be like Hitler. But the implication is probably if most of us could go back to the Weimar period in Germany before Hitler was was, uh, uh, you know, basically inst uh, installed as the chancellor in the early 1930s and had the sort of famous thing, you know, would you kill Hitler before he becomes powerful if you could as an ethical question that we that we ponder I think that's what that comment is sort of indicating at. And there, I think that's very much kind of a, a murky area between, you know, is, is that what he meant, that he really should be stopped at all cost? Or is he just simply trying to say that he thinks he's a far right extremist? I mean, I think that kind of language, it's, it's much, much harder to tell, but yeah. it still is nonetheless worrying. And I, I, I take uh, J.D. Vance at his word that when he said it, he really believed it. Absolutely. Very worrying language indeed, um, especially as we approach Election Day here in the United States. James Long, James Long, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's it for What's America Thinking. I'm Julia Manchester. Come back next week and be sure to like, share and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel.